It has been described as one of NASA's best kept secrets. It has also controversially been described as slightly corrupt. The selection of the crews for the Apollo missions was the responsibility of Deke Slayton, who was the director of flight crew operations. So just how did he choose the men to fly each Apollo mission? It is a mystery that lingers on and still causes endless speculation nowadays. Even the astronauts who were there at the time couldn't fathom out how Slayton did it. Walt Cunningham wrote in his book, The All-American Boys, I never was able to spell out the process by which one made it to a prime crew assignment. This is a sentiment that other astronauts of the period have echoed. William Anders stated, I could never figure out what the selections were based on. Michael Collins said, No one ever told me you were picked because of A, B or C. I really don't know. Buzz Aldrin noted, I had no idea at all how the selections were made. Neil Armstrong's take on the subject was, Deke Slayton was responsible for assigning the crews and I don't know what technique he used to do that. This ambiguity probably exists because the rules and influences that drove the crew selection process were largely unwritten. When it came to Slayton's personal view, his comments on how the Apollo 11 crew came together reflects his thinking on the selection process. People would talk about this process as if it were some kind of science, or as if politics had controlled it. All I can say is that a lot of factors, most of them beyond anybody's control, put these three guys in the right place at the right time. So how did he do it? What criteria did he use? The first rule that Slayton tried to adhere to was the pecking order. The astronauts largely came from the military services and the astronaut office was a quasi-military environment. What it meant in practical terms is when it came to picking crews, the Group 1 astronauts would never be placed by Slayton on a crew in a subordinate position to a subsequently chosen astronaut group member. An April 1964 memo spells out Slayton's thinking on the astronaut group hierarchy. The first group were called Command Astronauts, the second group were called Senior Astronauts and the third group were simply called Astronauts. With the number of seats on missions limited, the competition to get on a crew was intense and so the astronauts themselves would use any form of leverage they could to gain some headway over their fellow astronauts. For example, their military rank and their date of graduation from test pilot school. In the end though, this internal jockeying for position made little difference, as Collins pointed out. Before I started working for NASA, I thought the matter of service affiliation was quite important. However, it was not long before bonds were developed which were much stronger than colour of uniforms. At the end of the day, it did not matter what the astronauts did amongst themselves to get ahead, or how many space flights they had made, or how much time they had accumulated in space. What mattered most to Slayton was that they were motivated, had accrued a lot of training hours, and had performed well in their training. The next influence on Slayton's thinking was a personal prejudice. In theory, Slayton had said that any astronaut could fly any mission, meaning that all astronauts were equal. But in reality, some astronauts were more equal than others. Slayton placed test pilots at the top of the pile and were his first pick for Apollo commanders. Military pilots came in second, while the scientist astronauts were deemed an unnecessary inclusion in the astronaut office, and even faced, if not open hostility, a definite cold shoulder from Slayton. Collins said of this, there might have been a clique within a clique in the sense that I think that people who were test pilots tended to maybe band together a little bit more because at that point we were starting to get in non-test pilot astronauts. The next rule that became apparent to the astronauts was the rotation system that Slayton put in place. Put simply, an astronaut chosen for a backup role could expect to miss the next two flights and would then be given the prime crew role. Cernan described how this worked. The general rule was you would have an opportunity if things went well to rotate three flights later. Another part of the rotation system saw the prime command module pilot on a crew being promoted to the backup commander's role three flights down the line. This also explains Slayton's wish for the command module pilot's role to be filled by a test pilot. This progression ensured that Slayton's wishes for the commander to have prior space experience and to be a test pilot were met. If we follow the path of John Young, who had already flown aboard Gemini 3 
and commanded Gemini 10, we can see how the full path of progression under this rotation system worked. Young, who was a test pilot, was backup command module pilot on Apollo 7. He then missed two flights and was prime command module pilot on Apollo 10. He then missed two more flights and was named backup commander on Apollo 13. Missing a further two flights, he was named as prime commander on Apollo 16. Adhering to the pecking order and having a rotation system in place provided a recognized process and some sort of order. But as Slayton often said, neither were set in stone. Slayton was quite ready to break the rotation system for operational or personal reasons. Referring to the time after spring 1969, he wrote, I didn't feel any obligation, technical or moral, to keep it in place from that point. It is interesting to note that this was about the time that Shepard was back in the mix and Shepard and Slayton were plotting to get Shepard onto Apollo 13. Slayton also preferred that the early command module pilots on a mission that included dual operations with the lunar module, meaning that they would have to operate the command module alone, would require previous flight experience. Interestingly, Slayton dropped this rule for his first crew recommendation for Apollo 13 to allow Shepard to pick a rookie for his crew and so maintain superiority in both date selected and flight experience. Slayton's choice of Shepard for Apollo 13 was rejected by George Mueller, the associate administrator at NASA headquarters in Washington. But from that point on, all the command module pilots were rookies. The speciality that an astronaut had also influenced the allocation of roles. An astronaut specializing in the command module, for example Jack Swigert, could generally expect to be chosen for the command module pilot role. And likewise, an astronaut who specialized in the lunar module, for example Fred Hayes, received a lunar module pilot role. It was also an unwritten rule that any astronaut who had walked on the moon in the commander's role would not get a second moonwalk. This was to stop the same astronauts commandeering the missions and flying to the moon over and over again. Apollo 12 commander Charles Conrad had hinted at another Apollo flight after his return from the moon, but was quickly told no by Thomas Stafford. When it came to putting the crews together, Slayton generally knew who worked well with who. Slayton did state, I didn't give nearly as much weight to the compatibility issue as everyone thought. On the other hand, matching people where possible made life easier all around. Armstrong said, I had three or four meetings with Deke Slater and then we had a lot of talks about who might be available and be right to be on that crew, that sort of thing. It was his decision but he wanted your input. A vivid example of a commander using his veto was the case of Gus Grissom turning down Frank Borman as his pilot for the Gemini 3 mission. There were more intangible effects on the selection process. It helped if an astronaut had the backing of one of the big beasts in the astronaut office. Collins noted, I suspected that the fact that I knew Frank Borman, he and I were classmates at the test pilot school, Ed White and I were classmates at West Point. So for Gemini 7 and I was paired with Ed White on the backup, you know that might have had something to do with it. Cernan having the backing of Stafford is a prime example of how having one of the most influential astronauts in your corner could help brush aside otherwise career-ending incidents and get you the plumb job as commander of a moon landing mission. Another influence on the choice of astronauts for missions was Slayton's own opinion of them. During the selection process for each astronaut group, Slayton measured the candidates on a number of criteria, such as their military background, flight experience, flying skills, academic achievements, command experience, and personal impressions. Personal recommendations from other astronauts already in the astronaut office also helped form his opinion. Before even getting to Houston, Slayton had a good idea of where he placed a man in the pecking order of that particular group. For example, someone like Cunningham, who was classed as a scientist astronaut and was only there because Slayton added him at the last minute to make it a group of 14 instead of unlucky 13, was way down the list compared to someone like Richard Gordon who was a record-breaking test pilot with the backing of Group 2 astronaut Conrad. Cunningham noted that Slayton's first impression of an astronaut was one that was hard to shake off and influenced an astronaut's career. Once an astronaut had started working within the corridors of Houston, 
Their career would also be governed by their relationship with Slayton, with some suffering because of a clash of personalities. This clash would leave some men out in the cold despite being very capable, for example, Alan Bean. As he found out, working hard and doing a good job did not automatically translate to a crew position if you irritated the higher ups with outspoken views that contradicted their opinions. Bean stated, I would come to a certain conclusion, then I would go present this conclusion to Al Shepard or Deke Slayton. They weren't interested and they thought I was a little nutty. It also certainly did not hurt to be part of Slayton's hunting fraternity, or as Cunningham put it, one of the boys. You were either on the inside of the clique or on the outside. Being on the inside allowed you some room for manoeuvring, while being on the outside left you in the dark. Aldrin stated, It is difficult for me to explain the manoeuvring process because I don't think I really ever caught on to it. I do know it involved a great deal of subtle moving about and hinting, qualities that I don't possess. The next unwritten rule of Slayton's seems perfectly fair on the surface, but underneath it was a way for him to bolster his chances of getting a mission. It must be understood that Slayton had been, in his mind, unfairly removed from the active astronaut list due to a medical condition. Instead of leaving NASA, he had stuck around in a management role with the hope of getting back onto the active list. Anything he could do to help in this matter, he would do. To this end, if an astronaut had been removed from a crew because of medical reasons, Slayton would select the astronaut for the next available mission once he became eligible for selection again. Collins, Mattingly, and most controversially Shepard all benefited from this measure. Slayton's thinking, especially in the case of Shepard, was to set a precedent for medically grounded astronauts to get a mission. The final influences on crew selection were more or less out of the control of Slayton, the first being availability. Despite there being a large pool of astronauts to choose from, availability was sometimes slim because of commitments to other missions. Another factor was whether the astronaut Slayton asked actually wanted the role. Borman, McDivitt and Collins are just three astronauts who turned down Slayton's offer for another flight. The final factor was the fickle finger of fate. The deaths of Gemini 9's prime crew of C and Bassett played a huge role in the careers of certain astronauts. Likewise, the development of the lunar module influenced the early mission profiles and affected a couple of crew swaps that led to Neil Armstrong being the first man on the moon. Cunningham's take on this was, Timing is always crucial to those who want to get ahead. The only way to beat the pecking order was with the right place at the right time, stroke of luck, such as being on the back of crew when one of the prime crew members bought the farm or broke a leg. Underlying all of these unwritten rules were Slayton's principles that he promised nothing and he would break any rule if he needed to. As Cernan pointed out, Deke Slayton, our boss, never gave anybody any guarantees about flying. Was it right to have one person in charge of the crew selection process? Some at NASA resented the power Slayton had. James McDivitt declared, I think that was a screw up on the part of NASA management to have crews selected by one guy like that without any regards to the other people it was concerned with. That's the way they did it and I didn't like it. Christopher Kraft shared McDivitt's opinion saying, the first thing I did when I became the deputy was to go into Dr. Gilruth's office and say, I want that to be a more democratic process and I want people who are going to interface with those crews to know before they are selected who they are and have a voice in saying they don't want them. I thought it was wrong to have an astronaut in charge of the astronauts. That's the reason as soon as I had the opportunity, I put George Abbey in charge of it. I got rid of Slayton, I put him in another job. Being the director of flight crew operations was a job that Slayton would perform right up to May 1972, when he would present his last crew recommendation, a recommendation that would include himself as the commander. There is no doubt that Slayton used the system to serve his own best interests whenever he could. Selecting Alan Shepard for Apollo 14 and recommending himself for the commander's role on the Apollo Soyuz test project mission were just two ways he did this. The power that Slayton had made the system, in Cunningham's words, Machiavellian, morale busting 
and slightly corrupt. To all of the critics of this selection process, Shepard, who in his role as Chief of the Astronaut Office helped slate and put the crews together, simply said, Look, Deke and I are running this program, and this is the way it's going to be run. So are you any clearer? Would you know what to do to get onto an Apollo crew? If not, then you're not alone. Apollo 16 astronaut Charles Duke noted, To me, the selection process was a mystery. Duke would add, I wish I knew how an astronaut is selected for a crew, but it is probably one of NASA's best kept secrets. Do you think it was a fair system? Let me know what you think of the process in the comments below. And thanks for watching.